Starting a new topic, but still related with the mentalities. Because we, when we talk about mentalities, uh, aspect that we cannot avoid or uh, cannot leave without talking is the object. So in Pali, we call it Aramana. <coughs> and the last week's lesson, we had lots of questions and uh, regarding discussions regarding the subjective experience, and also today's topic. You may have a lot of questions with regard to how I explain about Aramana. The thing is, uh, in the Theravada, the Theravada tradition, this topic has been very discussed very in brief. Because the reason is, with the with the with the lecture, you will understand. Because Theravadians, according to my understanding, have uh, focused on only one aspect of the object. But if you go into the doctrines of especially the yoga charas, they have very detailed explanations on this topic. <laughs> but the Theravadians have given a very brief explanation. So based on these very limited sources, I am giving this lecture. And this lecture will uh, lead to the next day, for the following day even, next day. So we will start with the uh, basic points of Aramana. So I have given the topic as ob object in a subjective experience. So last week we discussed about the subjective experience. It means the mentalities, Chittupada, cognizes a particular object. So in the subjective experience, the object, uh, the subject part is the mentalities. Chitta and Chetasikas. So together we call them Chittupada in Pali. They focuses upon an object. That is called Aramana. Also, we mentioned, discussed about in the, in the last week, a chitta mentality cannot take itself, make itself as the object in any, so the all, entire, this entire event is called the subjective experience. <coughs> this is a word adapted by, from the Western philosophers, but we have our own definition, our own way of explaining this. So we added last week, which came into a lot of discussion, that while the chitta chetasikas are aware of a certain object, it has a sense of its own existence. It has a sense about its own existence. How do we prove it? When we recall back a subjective experience, we have a sense of familiarity. Because as the, of the object of a certain mentalities, can never be itself, but when we recall the incident back, whatever the emotions we had, because the entire focus is dedicated to the object, but when we recall the incident, we have a familiarity about the emotions, the feelings that we had already. So this suggests that there is a certain sense of, a sense of a, a, a certain sense within the mentalities about its existence. But I, I, we have to be very careful not to break the fundamental rule because according to Theravadians, mentality, the chitta cannot take itself as its object. So object of the chitta always be something else, but there is a certain sense of its uh, awareness of its own existence. So that's why we get the familiarity. So last week we discussed mainly about this part, the momentariness of this mentalities and also uh, uh, yeah, few aspects, subjective experience and also they are uh, connectedness. When they arise, they arise together. 
and we brought evidences from suttas to show that that the chitta and chetsikas are one subjective experience can does not arise separately they are always connected with each other with reference to mahavidala sutta now we are today we are focusing upon these objects aramana in this uh, uh, regarding this object of a subjective experience if we give a very simple definition object is what the awareness is about object is what the awareness or the understanding is about so this knowledge or the understanding awareness is directed towards a certain object so when we call a object without personal practical experience and also the information in the literature we find two aspects of uh, experiencing an object two aspects when we experience an object so if i put this into a very simple example for instance if i tell about a friend of mine that you have not seen and lead a story tell a story relate a story uh, relate a story about a certain monk uh, so while i am telling the story you will always have a certain kind of a image or a idea about who i am talking so that is the natural thing i always when we listen to a certain talk about someone giving about someone even though we have not seen him clearly we certain we develop a certain image or an idea about this particular person then for instance so at that time if we uh, if you happen to meet the real person you will find that the image you had while listening to my talk was most in most of the cases i think 100 100 100 out of 100 cases was not the same the image you had while you are listening to the talk and when you meet the exact person are completely different so this image what you created in the mind is based on your own experience on our own experience about the monk so when we say a monk we have visually think about a robe ball headed and certain appearance which are common to monks so based on our experience about monks we our mind constructs this object so what is this image which comes to our mind and what is the object what is the what is the uh, role the real monk plays in our subjective experience for this we have to go into the literature and find out evidence so when i say the literature i am referring to the tipitaka commentary sub commentary and all the i also of the teachers because i am talking about a tradition not exclusively talking about the uh, uh, about the canon so according to the literature this the particular now when for example the image what we have in our mind and the person we exactly refers to for example in this story if i happen to accuse or tell bad about my friend and think that you also joins me and accepts my idea and happens to accuses him with harsh word harsh accusing with harsh word but unfortunately think that monk whom both of us all of us accuses is an arahant so according to the literature what would be the result we all together have accused an arahant if someone argues while you think about this person you had a certain idea but when you meet the person if someone says the person i thought is completely different from the actual person so even if he is an arahant do we commit an accusation in arahant and are you upavada according to the our tradition there are the tradition yes you do so the mental image that you constructed while thinking about this actual person does not play any role when we accumulate the karma in such occasions an example is given about the ambapali you know ambrapali in ali so she was according to our story she was a sister of a buddha called sikhi who appeared 31 years ago so she was a monk nun not a direct sister means a half half sister because according to the tradition uh, buddha's mother delivers only a one child there is a nature of law because you can see in the sutta buddha mentioned after few days he passes away 
Anyway, now she became a nun and she was a Putujjana and they were, after the Buddha's passing away, they built a one stupa because according to the tradition, some Buddha's relics, these are extra information, some Buddha's relics become completely like a ball, they come together. Some Buddha's relics, relics get separated. In our allocation, in this asana, it is mentioned our Buddha's relics got separated, so the stupas were built all around the world. But according to the custom of Buddha stories, there was only one stupa with his own relics, except the hair relics. Now, uh, this uh, bhikkhunis, she, uh, the nun, the Buddha's sister, with a group of bhikkhunis was compounding this pagoda, the sacred pagoda. So while she was, uh, she was, uh, 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 how to say, walking around, walking around this compound, uh, going, uh, paying tribute, right, uh, going around, she saw a lump of flame on this sacred ground. So she really got offended, got angry, and because she knew there are a group of bhikkhunis and one was careless. So she scolded, who is this prostitute who had left or split on this sacred ground? She had no idea who had done it. Unfortunately, according to the stories and the story goes, that was a flame of an Arahant Bhikkhuni and she had sneezed without any conscious. She had a flame has come out of her mouth. And she didn't notice it, so didn't clean it. If she had noticed, surely she would clean out of the respect to the Buddha. But she didn't notice it. So, but um, uh, this Bhikkhuni, the sister of the Buddha, maybe he, she also had the brotherly affection. She scolded, who is the prostitute who, who, did, who uh, made this compound dirty? So, this, because she didn't know who had actually done it. We can imagine she may have thought about someone. But unfortunately for her, it was an arahant. The story goes further. She got lots of uh, unfortunate results because of this and became was a prostitute for 10,000 lives. And even in the last life, when she became an arahant, she became a prostitute. That is how the story goes. So what does this story mention suggest? While she was accusing, she exactly did not know who had done it. And she had also done it without intention. But she accused who is the one, who is the bad person who split the flame. So she was referring to the person to whom this flame belongs, to whose body this flame belongs. So according to the tradition, what the tradition says is, I'm talking about it from the point of tradition. So according to the tradition, if I, if I draw what the Amra, that her, my Abra Bali's past life was, if this was a chitta, so Chitta had a focus on the flame because of flame. She thought about the person who had put the flame. So now, while she was focusing, surely she would have a certain image of her lady because she knew it was one of the bhikkhunis. Then we can assume or a certain idea about the about anyone because she didn't know who it was. She was she was calling with the interrogative phrase, "Who the prostitute did such a thing?" So now, this image that she had on her mind while she was accusing would never be correspond or correspond or match with the actual person. But according to the tradition, the Kamma was accumulated based on the qualities of this actual person. So according to the tradition, in such a subjective experience, we have two aspects of the object. Theravadians strongly hold the idea, Theravadians strongly hold the idea that this object of this subjective experience is the object which this image refers or these entire mentalities are directed at. So these mentalities are directed at a certain object and this is the object of the subjective experience. The person may or may not have a clear apprehension or he may not perceive the object as it is. This image that we create, that we get created in our mind has no relationship in deciding the actual object of this subjective experience. So for the easy convenience, so the commentary and literature suggest that this image that we get in the mind, it is not an ultimate reality. Chitta Chetasikas are ultimate realities according to the tradition. This, what is this image that we get? The tradition has given very limited explanation. The ancient, the, the commentators have quoted a phrase from the ancient commentaries 
saying that this image that you get is made out of sanya. So they give the name Sanyaja. You know Sanyaja means born out of Sanya, like Kambaja. Sanyaja means, still they explain it further, this is not produced by Sanya as a reality is being produced by causes. This is how the mind perceives the object. It means how it perceives, how it thinks, how it considers. So then the commentary gave the example, the image may change according to the person's experience. Sanya nana tathaya. The nature, the variety, diversity of person's sanya. It means what we have accumulated throughout this life or with our rebirth or with our past experiences. The nature of our sanya decides the nature of this object. So that is why the example they have given, a group of monks listening to the same sutta, after they have listened, recited, they question each other, how did the sutta appear to you? Uh, one said, uh, it appeared to me like a river flowing from a very high mountain, Pambatiya Nadivi. Another one said, this appeared to me as a very long fast. Another said, it appeared to me like a very huge tree, which has lots of branches, fruits, and shade. So the commentary says why the same object appear in different ways to the person but they were referring to the same sutta because of the vanity of their sangha and that is the reason the same reason why when we are focusing on the breath the same breath the vayudhatu different yogis have different counter signs some may see the breath like a sun, some may, for some the breath appears like a moon, for some the breath appears like a stars, like stars, a garland, a stick, different uh, appearances may appear. That is because of the vanity of the sun. So this was given based on the teachings of the uh, uh, meditation, but we can imply this. So when we think about, now for example, we think about the Swedagon Pagoda. So there are two ways. I'll be discussing about this present and past object in detail in the next, like, next lecture, I mean not the following lecture, the next day, the following day. So when we think about the Swedagon Pagoda, for example, we can think it about in two ways. We can remember the experience we had while we went to the Swedagon last time, for the last time. So that time we call, we are focusing on a past object. object. Also, at this very moment, we can focus on the sphere of God and pay respect to it. At that time, we say, the tradition says, the object of the mind is the present sphere of God. Because it is directed towards this sphere of God pagoda. But at that time, we have a certain image, we get a certain image of the sphere of God. Think the sphere of God has been, the color has changed, or it is been under construction. We have no idea what is happening over there. But we get a certain image based on our own experience. So this image is not the real object. The real object is the person Swedagon which is being which is on that location. So how do we explain it? This real Swedagon is being perceived, is being known according to the nature of our sanya. So this mental image, I give a name for easy convenience. I give a name in this paper. This is the word that I give, meant mind image. Mind image means how it appears to us. When I talk about one of my friends, it appears to you in a certain way. This is the mind image. This is basically based on the perception that you have. But this image refers to someone. That someone is an actual object. This object, I, we call, I gave the name of the object of reference. Why we call it object of reference? It is the object referred by this mental image. In other ways, it is the object upon which at which the mentalities have been directed. So this is the same uh, phenomenon. Why the Theravadians say we can pay respect to a Buddha who has already passed away? We see in a story in the Vimana Vattupali. Uh, Sakka, the king of goods, have, according to the literature it says, the Sakka has uttered, even the Buddha has while living, or Buddha has passed away, 
If person, someone can pay respect to this great human being, having a same mindset, having the same mindset towards this being, and do a some deed. If you maintain the similar mindset, even while you are paying the living Buddha or the deceased Buddha, you will get the same kind of merits. So, for example, we pay, when we pay respect to the Buddha, we get a certain image based on our familiarity. Some may get a Sri Lankan image, a Burmese image, or whatever image you are, you are familiar with, right? Which you like. So, that is the nature. But does this image corresponds with the actual figure of the Buddha? No, it cannot be because no one has no 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 one knows what is the actual image, how it looks like. We have only information because during his time there were no we don't have any statues made looking at his figure. So but we say that we our mind is actually focusing on the real Buddha who has already passed away. So the mind image you get does not play a role, significant role in such cases of accumulating good and bad comments. So the final, the final message I want to uh, convey in this lecture is in a subjective experience we have two types of aspect, in this object of subjective experience has two types of aspects it is the mind, uh, one is the mind image or the idea. Sometimes this image may be very vivid, sometimes it is not vivid at all. So, most of the time, we, sometimes we get a certain image or idea and it refers to a certain object. So, the real, according to the Theravadians, they consider the real object of this experience is this object of reference. Because, according as some scholars have interpreted, the uh, doctrine of the yoga charas, they suggested, but there are different interpretations. They suggest that this object does not exist. There is no such an object which exists beyond the influence of the mind. All the mind, all the objects are created of the mind, creations of the mind. Theravadians do accept this vinyapti, vinyapti idea. Vinyapti means the creation of the mind. This object is created by, I will be discussing in the next lecture about how, how many types of uh, creations are possible and how does this relate to vipassana meditation and I will be telling that this object is utterly important when we are talking about vipassana meditation. So this object is not the only thing according to Theravadians. They, they advocate or accept the idea of an existence of a, another object which is beyond the influence of the chitta, whether we perceive or not, these ultimate objects do exist according to the tradition. So in a subjective experience, the final conclusion according to the tradition, I am representing the tradition, not my, I am not saying my, my own idea, as, I, as far as I understand the tradition, this mentality, the object of this subjective experience is the object which uh, the mental image refers or the mentalities are directed at. So, any questions before I read? Okay, yes. Is unfair? Yes, sir. Is it the first point? Which one? Unfair means in what sense unfair? Okay. Yes, <laughs> I would like to know. Okay. You Accuse, yeah. accuse that's the yeah. that's the 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 then human being cannot survive. Why? Just as I said, whatever you do, it's possible you make a mistake and you are accusing and no workers. Uh, that is a different case, right? That is a different case. We are talking about a different topic. For example, if I tell you a uh, direct the, the, uh, example given from Apadhanapal, right? Apadhanapali, we have a list of the Buddha's kammas that he has accumulated, the 12 kammas. One of the kammas is he accuses the Kasapa Buddha. Without knowing that he is a Buddha, he said, just by shaving the head, it is not easy for a person to be a Buddha. He said it out of looking down upon the Buddha. 
then he uh, the story goes the sutta mentions the gata gata mentions that because of this kamma that he because later he became a disciple of the buddha and he ordained under him he mentions that because of this kamma that he did out of ignorance he it took him 6 years nearly 6 years to find out the real path which was very long when you compared the uh, for self mortification period of other buddhas so likewise our literature have lots of evidences to show that that uh, we don't need to have a full understanding about the person for someone to accumulate something that's a very nice example so we there is a ball behind whether we know or not if we hit it will the hand will hit so likewise whether we know he is a buddha or not if we do a bad thing to that person you are going to get a huge karma so it is not if someone knows he is a real buddha no one would do bad things to him right so why people get bad results doing immoral acts towards such a great beings because mostly they don't know they are bad right so they are understanding about the values of the person does not understanding or not understanding does not free you from a certain deed if you know the values when you do a good deed it will intensify or it will increase the quality of your karma that is okay if someone knows he is a real buddha but still he do a bad thing out of out of defilement it will lessen his power of the karma because his consciousness he knows that he is doing a very bad thing to a very great person so it will reduce that is a different case but one point is this the even this image just not match with this this is not going to free you from if someone has committed a deed forget about the committing a deed but i want to say the real object of this chitta according to tradition is this real object this object which it refers to so that is the point that i want to mention it's it's not really related to kusala or akusala or good or bad or possible or not possible what i wanted to mention is that the image we have in our mind does not play the role in deciding what is the object of our of our mind for example according to the tradition we consider the rupa as a self so we have a idea of self in our mind so if you ask what is the real object of the mind without say you have your object is rupa what kind of a rupa he would explain is a non self impermanent rupa which begets suffering but the person thinks it as a self which is permanent or which brings lots of pleasure so his idea is utterly wrong according to buddha's buddha's philosophy but still he would say how he would explain is you cognize the rupa in a wrong manner the wrong manner happens here not here so even he considered it as a self even if he considered it as a creation of the god according to buddha the object is a non self reality so that is why the delusion plays the role so even but if, if if we if we deny this fact if you are going to focus this is the object only the object so we are breaking a very basic fundamental of the theravadian trend i'm not saying it's wrong if i talk about the tradition the fundamental of the tradition i'm explaining just the fundamental the fundamental of the tradition is object is this and this does not play a role in deciding what is the object of this subject to explain yes you know about the attitude yes they also have this yes right so that's why i say that is like this is why for example if you take the yoga acharya and theravadians there is a very uh, more a very important point that we we are separate different from each other that's why we cannot stay together in terms of the philosophy because when we contemplate when we explain the doctrine theravadians are exclusively saying there is an ultimate reality or existence beyond our biggest uh, uh, without whether we ex- regardless of the fact of our observation the reality is do exist this is a very basic fundamental of the theravada in some sense these are later developed i'm not talking about these ideas of early buddhism and later uh, buddhism which follow i'm talking when it became a tradition so first we should know what the tradition says and then we can argue about the, whether the tradition is correct or wrong it's a different case yeah. right it's a different case so the purpose of this lecture is to show what the tradition is right i'm not here to discuss whether the tradition is correct or wrong so the tradition for, well, according to the tradition right according to the tradition so what i want to say is the information suggests that 
the object of the mentality is, is what it refers to or what is behind is directed at and also the reference of the mental object. Any questions? Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll go to the standard. I just want to read some uh, important points. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll be reading the handout uh, because uh, it will give you uh, another opportunity to think about it. Object is what is known in a subjective experience. In other words, it is what the awareness is about. If explained precisely, according to the Ravadians, object is what at which uh, awareness is directed. We shall examine an example. One of our friends tells you a story about a monkey nose, but you have not met before. By listening to the story, an image appears in your mind about a particular monk. That image is constructed with your imagination, listen to the story, and your past experiences about figures of monks greatly influence the nature of this image. That image most probably does not correspond with the true figure of the monk story refers to. However, according to the Theravadians, at that time, the object of your mind is the monk about whom the story is. It means the person your mind image refers to. How do we prove this notion within the tradition? For that, first we extend our example. Now, during the discussion, your friend talks bad about that monk. Listening to that, you too joins him and accuses the monk with harsh words. I, I hope this is not true. Then, unfortunately, that monk happens to be an arahant. What will be the result? You commit the unwholesome deed called Ariyu Pawa, the accusation of a noble being. One can argue that the image of your mind did not fit with the actual nature of that monk so that you are not liable to bad results of the immoral deed. According to the Theravada tradition, image of the mind is not the actual object of the mind. The real object of the mind is the person mind image refers to. It means, according to the example, the monk about whom the story is. Evidences can be fetched from the literature. Once the sister of the Buddha city and nun saw a lump of flame on the compound of a pagoda, she got angry and scolded, which prostitute has split flame on the sacred ground. Unfortunately for her, that lump of flame was an of, of an araha. While sneezing unconsciously, she had split flame on the compound of the cheti and not noticed and cleaned it. Literature states that as a result of this terrible accusation, the sister of the past Buddha had to encounter great suffering in the sansara and had to be a prostitute for 10,000 lives. In a last life, we, she was known as Amrapati. Analyzing the story, the sister of the Buddha, Sikhi, had no idea exactly who was responsible for making the sacred compound dirty. Maybe even in even a certain image which did not match with the exact appearance of the Arahant Bhikkhuni had occurred in her mind while she was accusing. Whatever the image she had, her mind was directed toward the person who actually split the flame. Therefore, the object of her mind was the person out of whom flame came. Hence, she accumulated the Akamma of Aryu Upavada. In the same manner, when we pay respect to the Buddha, we imagine his appearance based on the Buddha statues we have seen. Those statues never look like the actual Tathagata. Nevertheless, when we pay homage to him, despite the nature of the image we have in our mind, our mind is directed to the Gautama Buddha who actually lived. So we accumulate the merit of paying respect to the Buddha. Thus, such an act paying respect to the Buddha by us equals with the act of paying homage to the living Buddha. It depends upon the mindset of the worshipper. If a person's level of faith, happiness and wisdom while paying homage to the deceased Buddha is as same as while he pays homage to the living Buddha, the strength of the accumulated merit is equal. This notion is thus mentioned in the Vimanavattu Pali. So I'll go to the last paragraph. As far as the tradition of Theravadians are concerned, in a subjective experience, the image or idea we have in our mind, I call it the mind image, while referring to a certain object does not have much significance. The actual object, the object of reference, which is being referred, is what matters in deciding the real object in an experience. So then we go into a, another point called difference between mind image and the object of reference. This mind image, if I explain a bit, this mind image something which is created or constructed based on the nature of our sanya. So the currently gives the name as sanya jam. But this, this Actual object, the object of reference has no relationship or relationship means is not affected by the nature of our sanya of our mind. It has its own existence. 
So therefore, the difference is this uh, object of reference has its own existence regardless of the person's ideas, but the image which appears in our mind is, is being constructed based on our own experiences. So that is the point. So this is the two differences. Then uh, we have various types of, I will call this as the object of reference. This is the mind image. This mind image does matter at the end of the next lecture, the today's next lecture, I will discuss about how this matters in Vipassana meditation and how the tradition has given lots of information to make this mind image clear or very uh, more closer to the object of reference. And then uh, this object of reference varies according to certain, certain aspects. And there are some important, very important, interesting points that how these two should be matched. I'll be discussing them in the ne next, next, next lecture. So till now, uh, at the moment, I'll be for, uh, we'll be discussing, we'll, I want to conclude that this, according to tradition, this image is a construction of the, basically a construction of the sun. But it's not only a construction of the sun. Vedana also plays a role in this part. Because the, uh, the next day, I'll be discussing about the flavor of an object. What is the taste? How the mind tastes, so because, the, uh, because of this tasting, the mind gets either somanasa, domanasa and upekka. So how the tradition would explain, how the suttas would suggest to understand what is, how to decide the feeling of a certain subjective experience. So therefore, for this mental image, Vedana also plays a very significant role, but the nature, the appearance of this image is mainly due to the nature of our accumulated sanyas. Right? So the information is given uh, in the literature. So uh, if you go to the quotation, uh, yeah, I'll be reading because this is, a, this is a new topic for some. As shown above, normally when we think of something, our mind perceives a certain image-like object. The correspondence of this image with the actual object determines on the fact how much we clearly remember the actual object. Even if we remember the object very well, at the very moment of thinking about it, if a, if a change has occurred in it, we will never be able to perceive it in, in its actual nature. This inability to perceive the Aramana in its actual appearance is not required for mentalities to cognize that object. To, be, to say that a mentality cognizes, focuses on an object, it is not necessary. But then you will have different levels of cognition. So sometimes we think all the chitta should have a cognition as clear as we have with the five senses. It is not necessary. Especially with the eye, we have a direct experience with the ear, nose, tongue and body. The object and the consciousness are very direct to each other, directly related with each other. And the next thing is the abhijnana. We know according to the literature, the person with abhijnana can watch the father things like he is watching to a CCTV camera. So this kind of experience or direct clarity or clarity is not necessary for the mind to be said to uh, to, to, to define a mind is as cognizing a particular object. The basic necessity for a mind to consider as it is cognizing an object is it is directed towards a particular object. That is the basic necessity. It doesn't need to have uh, clear, clear clarity about it. Even in Chakuvinyan, if you think, in our young ages we had a good vision. When we grow old, vision gets weaker and weaker. So on the Chakuvinyana, uh, of a person whose eyes is weak, without glasses, when he sees, he may see it very blurred. But do we say the Chakuvinyana, because in the younger ages, he had a very clear appreciation about the objects that he looked at. So does this mean when, because the Chakuvinyana, the weak Chakuvinyana is getting weaker, the ability of the eye is getting weaker, do we say the object of the Chakuvinyana has changed? No. The clarity of the object doesn't matter at all. What matters is to which the mind is directed at. That is the most important thing. So that is, uh, uh, in some cases, like the five senses, we have very clear apprehension. In Abhinyana, we have very clear apprehension. In most of the other cases, 
we may have in uh, especially in jhanas we may have very clear app apprehension or in magrapala chittas we we have a very clear object but in all, most of the other cases we our mind certain gets uh, get idea and the uh, the basic necessity is it is directed towards a certain object is directed towards a object for example if i give another example given in the binaya so there are two ways of killing a human or anyone killing with your own physical body and killing with all of you now for example take a terrorist leader sends a person to a certain area one of his uh, soldiers with a bomb suicide bomber and tell him kill as much beings as much as possible now at that moment he has his mind is directed towards uh, towards killing so according to the abhidhamma according to the tradition the mind when when it is when it is killing someone it should be directed towards a particular being so that's why the kamma is accumulated fully so that this terrorist leader doesn't know how many beings will be killed whatever the beings who are killed so but he while the bomb is being blast he may be doing something else maybe he is doing a wholesome thing for example he is helping some 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 uh, deceased person at that time he is getting a present mind at that moment he the bomb blast so he does not accumulate the karma when the bomb blast he his karma is done when he orders that is the karma he did the ordering was his karma not the blasting so at that moment he had no idea about who will be killed but he does accumulate kamas for each and every being who dies there so at that moment even though he doesn't know he has no idea picture about it his mind was directed towards whatever being who dies in a common sense so according to the tradition this common general idea is still enough to call that the person cognized all the beings who died because he had a general idea who were being killed as much as possible so the thing is the basic necessity of a chit to be a object of a chitta is that the mentalities are directed towards that particular object so that is the point that i want to convey so if we go to the next paragraph the nature of the mind image is greatly determined by the uh, capacities of sanya if said with more precision precision the mind image is made out of sanya hence can be called sanya ja thus this notion can be verified within the tradition with the information recorded in ancient commentaries when many monks were sitting having recited the sutta one monk questioned others how did the sutta appear to you one replied it appeared, appeared to me as a river flowing from a mountain another said to me it appeared as a huge forest the next monk replied it appeared to me as a large tree with many thick leaves and branches heavy with the lot of fruits and which provides good shade to them the same sutta appeared in various ways due to the diversity of their perception sanya so diversity of the perception is owing to the objects we have experience in our lives based on the nature of our perception the mind image or the idea about the object changes This is the same reason why counter sign, the Patibhaga Nimitta, appears in various ways to different yogis. So, what is this mind image? This is another point. What is this mind image? It is, is it an ultimate reality or a concept? The mind image does not arise with the mind. It is how sanya perceives the actual object. Sanya janti bhavana sanya parikapita na upadita na arose. it is what how the sanya considers about it then what is the actual object of a subjective experience can mentalities cognize actual objects aramana of mentalities is the object at which mentalities are directed it is also the same thing referred by the mind image hence called object of reference the nature of the mind image does not matter in deciding the nature of the object of reference therefore if mentalities are directing towards a real object which does does exist at that time they cognize an actual object but accordance in accordance with the nature of the perceived person sanya so we cognize the object in accordance with our own perception to conclude the lecture and uh, have a uh, introduction to the next lecture for example now this mind image sometimes this mind image relates to a actual person so we call the mind perceives a real object now in some cases what happens 
in some cases this my image for example think about uh, someone thinks about the wings of a tortoise for example or a almighty creator objects that do not exist for example so in such a case he still get an idea a my something called my image but it does not its reference is empty its reference is empty for example it thinks about the fantasy land or a thing that doesn't exist according to the tradition because i'm take, explaining it based on the tradition if someone thinks about the wings of a tortoise for something that doesn't exist so if we normally say if, if someone wants if some if it's very difficult to get something in sri lanka we say you are asking the wings from a tortoise <laughs> it's, it's it's not possible to happen so uh, this uh, uh, this my image if it refers to an object that doesn't exist at that time we call it's an abhuta object an object which doesn't exist if it refers to an object which really exists we call it bhuta ramana object which really exists so the next lecture will be about classification about these object of references how many types of objects of references can we find within the literature it is scattered here and there so how many types of objects of references can we find and also i will be discussing in the next chapter what is the importance of the object in vipassana meditation and how great the role played by this object image uh, mind image in vipassana meditation according to the tradition so this will be the uh, first lecture yeah so i'll be concluding if you have any questions yes there may be some Yeah, Anantriya Gamma can be happen related with the previous previous case. Bomb blasting. Yes. Okay. So Bandhu is asking because according to the uh, I think there is a debate in uh, in Vinaya most of the uh, times when we explain this uh, question arises because it says uh, as the Bandhu asked the question can a Anantriya Gamma happen? Uh, for example someone order someone to kill blast a bomb to kill humans much as possible unfortunately the the leader's mother has gone there and she also get uh, dies with this bomb blast so sir does the leader commits matricide according to the tradition yes so it is because uh, for example this example given in the commentaries is now there is a uh, Uh, straw of uh, hay, uh, but uh, how to say heap of heap of straw. Sorry, heap of hay. So within the inside there, there is a person, someone. So someone thinks he's a thief, and he wants to kill the thief. He knows there is someone. He knows there is someone, and he attacks at the thief, thinking it's a thief, and he kills the person. So he he had the intention to kill. He knows there is a living being, and he kills the person. So he had the intention. Chetana was there. It was a being. He knew it was a living being. He had the intention. He made the effort, and the being died. But unfortunately, it was his mother. So the commentary says he commits the anantriya kamma. Then why is the reason? To decide the kamma, the nature of your sanya doesn't matter. As long as you had the intention of killing. and your mind was directed to a certain object and it was a living being and you knew it's a living being so you had the intention of killing if you don't know if you don't know if you doesn't believe it's a living being you don't doesn't get the urge of killing so they match with each other and you kill what happens only argument is someone can argue yes it is a killing but it it is not a matricide someone say argue so the only thing that differs from it is he had a wrong perception so according to the tradition chetana is the reason for killing so yavan can argue he had a killing chetana intention of killing but not the intention of killing the mother so this is additional information we are bringing right we are bringing additional information so we have committed a killing panadipata now what who gets uh, who who is under this killing who got committed who got uh, affected by killing is the actual mother of a, of that person so he commits the killing uh, killing of a mother for this for an example someone offers the buddha when he was living he doesn't know he is a samasambuddha so what do you think 
Will he get the merits? He gets the merit because of his dana, because he's offering. Will the qualities of, a, of the Buddha will increase his merit or not? According to the tradition, it does increase. The person's understanding about the Buddha is not going to happen. So the same formula applies here. He didn't know its mother. He killed a being. And that being happened to be the mother. So the, all the good qualities of a mother towards the child is involved in deciding the heaviness of the karma. Like, he someone gave a dana, he doesn't know it's a Buddha. But the, all the good qualities of the Buddha matters in increasing the level of his dana. So the sanya is what matters. Sanya or understanding, or whatever, whatever the mental act, uh, mental phenomena of knowing what it is actually is what is lacking here. I do, we do appreciate that there is some lacking part, but that part is not going to let you free from the unwholesome deed or not letting you uh, uh, lose the opportunity of the wholesome deed. So that is the same phenomenon which applies here. Thank you for bringing that question. Here also, the mind image is created because of the base of your sanya according to countries. So the sanya doesn't play much role in deciding the nature of the karma. What decides the nature of the karma? Your intention and the actual qualities of the real object. It just matters. And that is the basic criteria to something to become a karma. To increase or decrease the level of the karma, sanya does matters, understanding does matters, level of the anger, hatred, emotions does matters. This will increase and decrease the level of the karma. It will not decide whether it was a karma or not. So that is how the tradition would explain this. Yes. My memory is not very clear, but uh, like I, I read some explanation that like some farmer yeah. was burning his field, yeah. and uh, the Ajaka Buddha, Buddha was meditating at there, and the Buddha wasn't killed because he was uh, in the middle of the Samapati. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so like I, I, I don't know. Um, the, if, he wasn't intent to kill the Buddha, so like um, he, at that karma, he wasn't being like um, uh, kind of uh, the heavy like. Uh, Did the akusala? Yes, heavier. But uh, he was kind of hiding. Uh, he burned someone, so like he was kind of hiding. So like then he got kind of a, a karma or something. But like um, according to your explanation. Even like he was burning in the field means that some living being he could accidentally kill. So like if if, if it was like a or Buddha. So I think did you get the correct point? Because uh, actually it was not a farmer. To the story, shall I relate it to the story I know? It was a group of queens, oh. right? Princesses. It was a past story of Samadhi, right? So they were uh, they took a bath and they wanted to. Uh, Heat their bodies, so they burn a certain forest, a small forest. Unfortunately, Pacheka Buddha used to live there, right? And he was, as you said, he was in the Nirodha Samapati and he was not affected by the heat because of the near power of the Nirodha. But they didn't know, the queens, the princess didn't know that he is not affected. But he is a, uh, the king is a pious devotee of this Pacheka Buddha. So they got afraid. If the king gets to know, we'll be, we are in big trouble. So let, is, let, let me finish the Buddha without leaving any trace. So then they put more fire to burn the Pacheka Buddha. So uh, unfortunately, she was, uh, they were not, uh, she, he was not affected by the, by the fire because of the Nirodha Samapati. Now his question is, now the second part, they intentionally try to kill, it is clear. His first question is, now according to what I said, I mentioned, now whether you know the person or not clearly doesn't matter in deciding the I said intention is the first number one and the nature of the object. Now what his question is, because when you burn the forest, you know surely lots of beings are going to die. So 
accidentally they happen to be arahan so according to my explanation i think my i i, I got your uh, got your question right right so according to my explanation it matches like he knows that lots of beings are going to die and unfortunately arahan came so even in the first act isn't he accumulating karma it's a very nice question i'll be discussing this in detail when we come to the lectures of karma the next point is knowing that this karma is going to effect and the intention to effect is two things i'll repeat again knowing that your act is going to give some results unavoidably is a one thing intention to do the act of effecting the others is different so that is why according to buddhism when you are doing farming surely you have to burn the fields you have to dug the earth creatures when you are building houses when you are building roads lots of ants small creatures will surely die get crushed as long as you don't have the intention to kill them as long as you don't have the intention to destroy them they these acts are not considered as karma right you know it no, pretty clearly you know this is going to happen so you know day to day acts it don't normally happens if you consider the micro beings as living beings it is it is, it is uh, inevitable other i'm not talking about them so the knowing that this act will surely mean destruction to certain kind of beings is is one thing doing with the intention of bringing them destruction is another thing so the first thing is not a reason for something to become karma but when it comes to vinaya monks have to be more careful that is a different case buddha accused the monks of uh, there was a, a kuti built by you can see the daniya story in the second parajika a kuti built out of complete mud completely mud and what he did was he built a complete mud kuti and burned the entire kuti and it became so attractive it was like shining i right? burned the entire kuti with a huge fire then buddha laid down a rule that you should not burn make us uh, entire kuti with mud, mud and burn it his accusation was doesn't this monk has any compassion towards these living beings this was his accusation so this is for samanas this is for monks because monks have to be more careful about their acts regarding the other beings so but when it comes to the kamma level buddha never accused it as a kamma another point we have another sikha pada called using the water in which living beings are living using the water in which living beings are living the court tradition has analyzed every sikha pada so the government says some sikha pada some rules are done only with akusala chitta some rules are done with kusala chitta some rules are done with kriya chitta and so forth right so killing is always done with unwholesome mind ab do manas vedana but this act of using the water knowing intentionally that there is creatures can happen without the dosa mula chitta even why is that it is not an act of killing so our tradition has the idea it's not like the idea of the nigantas because they consider whether your intention doesn't matter the physical act is what matters if you look into the upali sutta there's the discussion if you happen to crush a creature you are committing a karma kaya karma is more powerful than the manokam chit manokam but according to buddhism intention it is what matters so therefore even we know such things are going to happen if we do it without the intention of killing we are not accumulating a karma but if you restrain out of the compassion towards the being you are creating a good good wholesome being that is a different case right that is a different case that's how i would answer the question any questions okay so we'll meet after 15 minutes